Hello, my name is Murray Fraser and I'm a professor at the Bartlett School of Architecture. The Bartlett is the architecture school at University College London here in the UK and is known internationally as, as a creative source for design ideas. It's my privilege today to introduce Neil McLaughlin's Velux Daylight Lecture, uh, which you'll hear in a minute. But first, a little bit about Neil. Neil was born in Dublin and in Ireland and was then taught at the University College Dublin School of Architecture. On graduating, he started working for Scott Talon Walker, which is Ireland's most Miesian architectural practice. Neil came to London in the late 1980s and from 1990, we both started teaching together at the School of Architecture at Oxford Brookes University, or Oxford Polytechnic as it was called then. We had a remarkable group of young tutors teaching there at the time, but Neil stood out. His first notable project was for a Carmelite monastery in Kensington. And then looking at that project again in retrospect, and also looking at his work since, I would suggest that there's four key elements that keep recurring in Neil's projects. The first of these elements is architectural history. And when I say architectural history, I don't really mean the kind of usual types of references that architects often cite when talking about their work, but rather sort of reflections on, so we say, lesser known and perhaps more interesting buildings um, from past eras. And to give one example, Neil is continually fascinated by the Neolithic buildings of no Northwest Europe, both in terms of the larger places of ritual, but also the ordinary domestic dwellings of people at that time. The second of the elements is, I would say, art history. And if you look at, for instance, the Car Carmelite Monastery, you can see that he was looking at Renaissance paintings by Giorgione and Fra Filippo Lippi as a kind of a source of inspiration for the design of the interiors of that building. The third element in Neil's work is literature, and probably more specifically, Irish literature, uh, whether that is in the form of novels, uh, notably James Joyce, or else poetry, uh, and Seamus Heaney being a key reference. Indeed, the soft and subtle phrases of Heaney resonate throughout Neil's work and the explanations of, of his projects, which I'm sure we'll hear about later. The fourth and final element is about building tectonics, and Neil was really absolutely fascinated by the way in which colours, textures, materials, uh, and meanings of materials come together in architectural work and how they're assembled. My use of the phrase four elements is not accidental. Neil is, in my view, the most interesting contemporary interpreter of the legacy of Gottfried Semper. Yes, Semper, writing in the 19th century, was kind of more interested in creating a grand theory that might link architecture, technology and culture, which is not Neil's aim, uh, Neil's aim. But actually, if you look at the kind of way in which Neil thinks about his projects and look at many of his design decisions, and for instance, the dog tooth uh, brickwork at the Cudderson Chapel, uh, which we'll see, and also the castings and patternings of the blocks for housing at uh, the Olympic Park or at King's Cross. You can see there's a real sensibility that owns a, a strong debt to Semper's ideas. Neil, however, is very much an architect of today, uh, increasingly being commissioned uh, to do projects in places like Canada, Netherlands and further afield. Uh, he continues to teach regularly at the Bartlett and has done so for, for many decades now and he is now the Professor of Practice there. He has won many awards and has had three of his buildings shortlisted for the prestigious annual RIB Sterling Prize for Best Building. As well as designing beautiful exterior forms on his buildings, you will see that the interior spaces in his projects are amongst the richest around and not least for their exquisite use of natural daylight which will be the subject of this lecture today. I give you Neil McLaughlin. Thank you, Murray. When I was asked to speak about uh, daylight in a lecture, I wanted to move away from the sense that daylight is a kind of neutral commodity, um, which we have an endless amount of, and which we use in a practical or functional way in our work. And I wanted to try and ground the idea of daylight in a much, or to situate it in a much deeper way within our own identities. And that's why I've chosen the lecture title, Circling a Star, 
because daylight is, I suppose, the natural consequence of the fact that that's what we're doing all the time. The sense that our world isn't constant orbit around a star, which is beaming radiation at us, is the thing that brings all of the life giving energy to the Earth, sets up the climate, affects the geology, and is a fundamental part of our being. In fact, it would be difficult for us to say that we can live outside that paradigm. So deeply does it affect every aspect of our being that we have to think of daylight as being probably the deepest ground of our own existence. And it's that sense that I want to bring across in the lecture today, not just that it's a thing or a functional thing that we deal with, but even the deepest parts of our spiritual identity and the meanings that we, 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 we create that were always implicated in daylight. So there are just some headings I want to begin with, first of all, um, to broadly contain uh, the discussion of individual projects, which I do later on. And the first one is regulation. The idea that the purpose of daylight within our own biology is to regulate the way in which our um, biochemistry operates during the day. And this simple diagram here showing the circadian ry rhythms tells us about everything from digestion to waking and sleeping to cardiovascular efficiency um, to our, our moods to our secretion of hormones all of these things are driven cyclically by daylight and it's that sense here we are orbiting the star spinning round and round and round and even our daily rhythms are being established by that and moving on to the sense of seasonal change these beautiful images from the Duke of Berry's books of hours one showing February and one showing May the sense that not only does our landscape change around us, the conditions of temperature, because of our ang the angle at which we face that star, but also our rituals, our festivals, the things that we do and the meanings that we create are all bound into that cycle. And just here are some very simple examples. From 3500 BC on the east coast of Ireland in Newgrange, for one morning at dawn, the sun comes right into the centre of the earth and illuminates this chamber. The darkest day of the year, the sun illuminates the central chamber. In Easter time, the Greek Orthodox ritual, Christ has risen from the dead. This great inversion, the dead are alive at the, at the junction point between spring and summer. And of course, modern festivals here um, that we have, um, uh, these uh, rock and pop festivals like Glastonbury, which happen in the middle of the summer, which is about being under the sun at the brightest time of year. But once again, back into the autumn, the Day of the Dead in Mexico. This is really fascinating. It's the junction between summertime and wintertime in October. And anthropologists will tell us that these junctions, these boundaries, are associated with inversions. So the dead walk, light is brought into the nighttime, and people play tricks on each other. These boundaries, these junctions between the seasons of light are things that are profoundly bound into our human culture. And then this idea of orientation, I want to tease out from a very basic idea. I woke up, I slept in two days ago. I meant to get up at seven and I woke at 10. As soon as I opened my eyes, I knew I had slept in. How did I know? There was something about the color temperature of the light in the room that told me that my sense of where I should be in time and the sense of where I was was different. So it's this sense we have that the color of the light at the particular time of the day and the latitude that we're in is telling us something about the time we're in as well, that it, it locks us into our place in time. And I'm fascinated by this uh, painting by Turner to look at all of the color temperatures of light in this image from the golden orb of the sun through to the greys and mauves and the deep indigos. These are all the different temperatures that daylight can present to us and it's uh, particularly living in a maritime climate as we do here in, in the United Kingdom. It's the sense that architecture can mediate these changes in the colour of light and that by doing so it's once again placing us back in the world all the time. This is what fascinates me. And this other simple thing about orientation Picasso's great painting of night fishing at Arles, the, um, at uh, Antibes, sorry, the, the, the sense that the fish are being drawn up towards the light, that the fishermen hang the light over the boat and the fish are drawn up towards it. And that heliotropism is something that fascinates me in architecture. It can allow you to structure space and to naturally intuit that people will move towards brighter spaces. And look at this amazing painting by Goya where the scene in the foreground is more dimly lit than the scene in the background. And so you get this extraordinary inversion in the painting, where the central subject of the painting, 
The thing that compels your attention is actually the event that's occurring in the very background of the painting. The, pe the people's attention is being naturally led and drawn to places of higher illumination. This is a great Baroque idea, the illuminated space beyond, which we see in architecture, but we can also see in this painting too. And what happens is that we are drawn out of one space through into the other and given this sense of motion towards. It's this sense of orientation that light gives us that to me is central to architecture. And a much more subtle effect here, and one I really enjoy, is the way in which light can communicate meaning. It's perfectly clear in this image here that the most brightly lit part is the bottom left-hand corner and the dimmest part is the top right-hand corner. And what you have is an angel, a creature of light, with wings that are made to be iridescent in the light, is coming in from the light into the shaded interior. Naturally, we think of this image as the light coming into that darkened interior, but I'd ask you for a moment to think about the darkness coming out of the interior and starting to eat up that light from the top right-hand side of the image. And there is the woman, the human, the domestic figure, the woman contained in the domestic environment. Rather than the garbs of light she has on, she has the garbs of darkness or of night on her. And so we have this sense of the true meaning of this, the supernatural event that's occurring the angel announcing the conception of Christ to Our Lady, has actually been already given to us by the way in which the light is structured in the painting. And in the same way, I think architecture can structure meaning with light. Of course, we talk about light all the time as a positive commodity, but architecture, and I think human culture, deals with absence as much as with light as a positive value. And I remember going to visit Leverance's church at Klippan in Sweden, on a really dark November day, where there was drizzle outside and low grey clouds. And when you went in from the darkness of the Swedish landscape, could it get darker? Yes, Leverance can make it darker with those dark bricks. And you're in this great knot of darkness. And just as we were about to leave, a tiny glimmer of sunset came horizontally through all the windows. And it was more intense for me as a manifestation of light than any stained glass window. That single moment of low northern light coming through the windows. And so that sense of playing with darkness and playing with strong contrast between darkness and light, and light is a rare commodity, is also, I think, something that's central to our sense of uh, placing ourselves in the world and architecture. And it's no accident that the first sacred spaces seem to have been in caves. And the last representation of light I just want to talk about in, in terms of my generalization is the sense of damage. We think of light as being a positive commodity, but in fact, in as much as life gives us light, daylight gives us life-giving energy, it's also an extremely corrosive substance. Ultraviolet light will, embritten, will embrittle almost any organic substance. And the sense of light that's some, being something that burns, I think is beautifully illustrated in these images here which are uh, taken with special photographs showing sun damage in the skin. And when we detail buildings more and more now, we're aware of the fact that one of the first layers of damage and change and age and destruction of buildings is light itself. At the first layer, it's the light that's radiated at the building. But after that, it's the light that creates the water vapor in the atmosphere that rains down on it, that interacts with the light, that creates corrosion. So that sense of light as being an ag agent of destruction as well is something that we have to think about in our architecture. And the phrase I love, and I want to talk about this in relation to the first project I'm going to show you, is the moment when Galileo is um, interrogated by the Inquisition about the heliocentric structure of the universe and he's made to retract his claim that the, the, the earth uh, orbits around, around the sun and when he steps out of the convocation where he's been forced to retract it he stamps his feet on the ground and says and yet it moves and it's that strongly counterintuitive sense that has always fascinated me that we feel we're the still point and that everything is moving around us but in fact it's our motion around the sun that's generating the sense of change that we perceive. And it's that relationship between stillness and movement that I'm fascinated by. And what we do as architects, here we are in our practice, preparing a piece for the Biennale, where we say we set up static frames, simple structural frames in that moving environment, and we allow that movement and change to pass through our buildings. And here in this little archipelago off the western coast of Europe, uh, these are where our projects are set, where the sun is always throwing water vapour up into the atmosphere, uh, creating veils and mists, strong sunlight, fogs, rain and so on. So you have this constant changing atmosphere, which is central to the work of our practice. 
And the light is very rarely the, the light of very harsh shadows or direct on-off light. It's usually a thousand shades of intermediate light which create the architecture that we're interested in. And the idea that this architecture, in a sense, is a fixed frame for human inhabitation is one of the things I want to talk about. And I'm going to read a little piece from the book which we produced for the last Biennale, uh, just a couple of paragraphs. Are buildings immutable artefacts, or are they what passes through them? They frame and endure the changing light of day, comings and goings, the regular rhythms of use, and the slow burn of weather. A building is built for a purpose, but it acquires new meanings over time. It is both an enduring physical presence and a mediator for known and imagined things that flow through it. When we design buildings, we intuit that certain elements are broadly reliable and repetitive. Habits of use, the movement of light and air, the bind of gravity and the changing seasons all have to be answered by the forms we make. We also understand the deep human need to be situated physically and above all socially. When this need is met, we invest in a, in a location and call it a place. Architecture is the framing of these places. Now I want to just look at a number of devices that I'm fascinated by. The first one are these uh, orreries that come about in the 17th century and use the advancing science of clockwork to build models of the universe. Absolutely beautiful and precise mechanical ap apparatus. And these elegant stone um, uh, sundials, which we find in Jaipur in India, where you can uh, calculate the time of day down to a few seconds in these huge stone discs that are inscribed um, to, to, to watch the sun passing over the day. And these wonderful medieval calendars in Gdansk Cathedral, where the pointer is telling you what day it is, what time it is, uh, the songs and festivals that are required at that moment, the interaction of cosmic movement and human culture in one device. And so we made an apparatus, we conceived of an apparatus. This is a plan and section together. The circle is the plan and the L-shaped thing is the section. At the bottom of the L-shape you see a little crescent shape. That's a table on which we're going to put models. And on the left-hand side you have a tall tower with lights which point down at the table. If you turn that table, which you can do by hand, an ingenious little apparatus means that the lights will tilt. And when they tilt, they change their color temperature. So by standing in the space, you can turn the table. And by turning the table, you can make the light move through 24 hours in a day. And onto it, we put these simple structures, buildings which we have built that are simple frames made of timber or stone, uh, which, will, which, will, which will change and transform in the, in, in the light of this apparatus. And here are some of my team uh, with, the, with the joiner uh, making this great big apparatus in the workshop. The sky is set at the latitude that we're at here in, in, in the UK, uh, with the night sky set at that latitude. And here we are making this night sky, onto which we put our objects. And at the edge of it, for the six buildings we designed, we have a calendar of all of the festivals. For a church, we have the church days. For a sports building, we have every fixture in the rugby calendar. For the restaurant, we have, which is a fish and chip shop, we have all the fish and season uh, on every day of the year, right around the, the, the perimeter of this piece. And so when we see it standing as an object in the Biennale, in the, in the Arsenale, you can see it standing there about eight meters tall with the models in the middle of it. And it's possible to walk up to that, to approach it, to see the calendar around the edge. And the rim of the edge, you can see, uh, people who remember old-fashioned record players will recognize this. The stylus which sticks out from the tower sits on a little plywood rim and the rim gets higher and lower depending on how you rotate the table. And as the stylus tilts up and down, it creates a tilt in the lights so that completely mechanically the lights change their angle and their color temperature. And this is a sense of the stylus running over the rim with the fixed calendar on the outside showing everything from the phases of the moon to the festivals of each of the individual buildings. And here's Ben pushing it around. So there's a handle that allows you to push this rotating table around and the models begin to turn in the light. And you can see the model which is beside me here, um, the, the song school for Trinity Hall in Cambridge, is, uh, is set into that piece. A theatre for a, a college in Oxford, 
the fish and chip shop for the south coast of England, and you can see this collection of models on the turntable. But I'm going to just let this film run for a moment to give you a sense of the changing light. It's night time in this image now. And the sun is about to rise. we start to see the light changing through the day. And so that sense of the, of the fixed frames in the moving world was something that was fascinated me. But after we had made the piece, and here it is rotating further around, after we had made the piece, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to try and play the Galileo trick, and yet it moves, and to put my mobile phone fixed into one of those spaces between the buildings, and to see the sense that we have on Earth. So here it is, the ceiling of the Arsenale will now become the night sky and we get the sense that we live in a fixed world while the heavens rotate around us. In fact, it is we who are moving, and it's that inversion that gives us that sense of light moving through space, of buildings and their changing moods, the way in which shadows are cast across surfaces. All of that is given, and the columns and the ceilings of this are like the wheeling of the night sky over our head, and the movement of the sun through the sky. So I want to move from that description of a, a generalised idea of how we locate our architecture in relation to daylight to a number of themes, and I'll talk about some projects and try and frame them by a theme. And the first one is the first project I ever designed, which Murray mentioned, which is a monastery from 1990. And I want to talk about the colour temperature of daylight. We had two tiny rooms in existing buildings next to each other in a little monastery in central London. They were both quite small spaces. And one was a sacristy, the one on the left, and one was a tiny chapel in a Victorian room, the one on the right. And I was fascinated by the idea of a sacristy, because a sacristy is a place which a priest walks into to prepare for the ceremony of the Mass. And when they walk in, they walk out of their everyday life with its normality and its domesticity. And when they walk out the other door, they're on the altar, vested for the ceremony, for the ritual and the consecration. So a profound change happens to their sense of the world that they're in as they pass through this modest little space. And we conceived of an idea of creating a kind of line of light across the room and made lots of experiments about different ways of bringing light into that space. But the image that I had in my mind was another image of profound transition between the domestic and the sacred. This is another Annunciation, this one by the painter uh, Lippi, the, the, the Italian painter Lippi. And here we see the Virgin meeting the Angel. The Angel is outside in the garden, garden and the Virgin is within the house. But in a sense, the profound difference between the supernatural creature and the domesticated human, are, who are brought together into the same space of the picture, is dealt with by this architectural element, which is the loggia. And I love this hand coming down in the middle, splitting the painting in half. And what I fell in love with was the angel's iridescent wing. And I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to make a wing-like form that comes down into the space and splits the room in half between the sacred side and the domestic side? So we made this section, and we were really fascinated by creating a section that would allow different colour temperatures of light into the same space. In the middle of the section, you see a funnel shape which brings light straight off the sky vault. And we expect that light to have the clearest daylight register. And beneath it, there's a counter where we lay out vestments for the church day. And each day of the church calendar, there are different colored vestments from green to turquoise to gold to purple to black. Um, and so when you walk into the room, we wanted the brightest surface in the room to be the one which has the vestments on it. At the same time, we needed to illuminate the rest of the room. So the little L shape of that angel's wing that comes down divides the light and half of it has bounced back up into the other side of the room again to give you an indirect diffuse daylight coming down off the ceiling which gives you a broad task light for the room. And the one final bit on the left hand side there's a tiny window that opens up a chink between two buildings out into a garden and it faces south and we've turned it into a window seat so the priest can take a book, a prayer book, and lay it on a desk and sit looking out into the garden. So these are three kinds of light we're trying to create in the space. And I hope this image will give you a sense of the first two. The, the daylight coming straight off the sky vault down onto the coloured vestments, and then the indirect light bounced back up onto the white ceiling. Uh, the deep wall there is full of different cabinets which, which contain everything from 
altar objects to relics to statues and so on, all of which have got sacred significance. And then there's that other kind of light coming in the window from the garden, this tiny little chink of light that's brought into the window seat. You can see the priest's book laid open where they can read it in the daylight. But given the grey colour temperature of the room, one of the things we've done to amplify the sense of warm light is that every surface that receives the light inside the window is made from oak. So the light is, 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 is re-warmed up, like putting a buttercup under your chin to get reflected golden light off it. And so you can see in this image here the different colour temperatures that the camera has picked up. The bluish indirect light, the white light falling onto the vestments, and that grey surface to the left has got natural south light falling onto it, warmed up by the timber of the window reveal. In the room next door, we wanted to create a very simple comparison between the chapel for the priests and the garden outside. And we had this idea that the chapel is a place of symbolism, of eternity. It's made of very simple shapes, and it should, it should, it, it should represent endlessness. The garden is about change and season and cycle, and the complex tangle of roses at the window. And I had an idea in my mind of a very simple retinal fizz that you would get by seeing a green garden through a golden room, and that the, green, the gold of the room would change your perception of the green of the garden. And I looked at this lovely painting by the Master of the Life of Mary, which shows this sacred space contained by a golden screen, and beyond it, the ordinary domestic humdrum world. But all of the sacred objects in it are held within this space. And I imagined the very simple daylight coming in the existing Victorian window, but that we would make a similar screen within the room of gold, which the monks would sit within, and that, that, that it, it would frame and mediate their view of the garden. And this gives you a sense of all the materials we use, from Nuremberg amber glass to oak to stone and so on, to create that sense of a kind of golden world looking out through to the green, and the simplicity of the objects playing against the tangle of foliage in the garden. And as a kind of microcosm of the chapel itself, the tabernacle, which is the object in which the consecrated bread is kept, is treated then as an oak object that's lined on the inside with gold. And so the centre of this golden space is the most, manifest the most uh, positive manifestation of golden light in the room. And it was an interesting thing that the monks who prayed there are all dead now. My clients, I went back there, all of them have died in the last 30 years. But about 15 years later or 10 years later, we were asked to come back by monks who had passed through this chapel and to design another chapel for them in Dublin. And it was one of the most unprepossessing rooms I've ever been in. The sense of deep gloom in the room, the sense that all of the light that was seeping into it was coming through dark courtyards. And this image here shows the courtyard on the right-hand side with its very spare light and its tiny window in the bottom right. And you can see the inside of that window with the light coming into it. So what do you do when the, when, the, when, when the sight you've got, when the light that the sight is giving you is so mean? What do you do with that light? And we thought the thing to do is to try and transform daylight into a precious commodity by playing daylight off artificial light to allow the artificial light to create a sense that the daylight is extraordinarily special. And so we, what we did was we took these two very simple windows which look into the courtyard. This is the room here with its slightly odd shape. And we created a complete room inside that made of oak. And the oak room stands off the walls of the old room. And then we played almost a theatrical trick, which is that we painted the inside of the room, the walls of the old room, gold. And we shone very diffuse light onto the gold. So when you saw through the oak, you saw this glimmer of gold through the oak. And I'd read a lovely story about um, a timber church that was made and that every plank in the church was like a human soul in the worshipping community. And I thought, what a beautiful idea. So here we'll make the planks and we'll just separate them by about 10 mil so you can see through them to the gold, but that each plank has its own identity. So they're both bound together and individual as a community should be. And this is the model that we made of that, that the seat that the priests would sit in is backed by this timber screen which rises to the ceiling, which you can partly see through. What I want to do just quickly now is to show you different manifestations of that screen. That's the same window as we saw earlier the same daylight coming through that window against a plain oak surface. And then you can illuminate the oak surface in front with these lights and behind with that golden wall. So you get this tiny sense of gold coming through and it completely changes your perception of the colour temperature of the light coming through. And when you expand that out into the room, you get a gradient across the room 
from the window which we've placed there, which allows the cool temperature of the light to wash across the warm temperature of the gold. And then we can place the figures in it in the worshipping space. And you can see also that in terms of artificial light, that we've just put tiny recessed uh, side emitting fibre optics onto the top of these beams, so that the ceiling is lifted slightly above them. And so you get this sense of a world that's hovering between the background daylight <coughs> and the artificial light of that space. And it's a way of playing these two colour temperatures together so they fizz or play off each other. And this gives you a sense of that original window that you saw first of all, with the candles lit, and the sense that the daylight coming in from this rather unprepossessing courtyard has been transformed into something that feels cool and precious in the warmth of the room. The next subject I want to deal with is the idea of regulation, and it's something that we're fascinated by. We've done work on for people with dementia over a number of years, and I'm fascinated by the sense that we are completely created by light, that our rhythms are, 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 are profoundly implicated in light, and it's something that we don't necessarily notice in our day-to-day -day lives. It becomes an acute thing for people with dementia for all sorts of reasons, and I have to talk quite briefly about this, but the idea of, with hold, of holding up the personhood and the independence of people with dementia when they move into residential or daycare, uh, the idea of holding on to their individuality and allowing them to thrive and to have agency and independence was absolutely central to our thinking. One of the key things about dementia care is a lot of people who are brought into dementia care are kept indoors more and more for their safety because if they go outside they will fall. But of course if you go outside you absorb vitamin D which is the thing that strengthens your bones which means that if you do fall you're much less likely to have a fracture or an injury. And so what you get is a kind of counterproductive cycle that people who are being held indoors for their safety are actually being in endangered in the long term because the danger is that it's embrittling their bones. And it's that sense of allowing to a measured amount of daylight protecting people in shade that allows people to thrive and the idea of gardening as being an activity that they can continue on to the end of their lives of going out and being in the garden as being a positive aspect of their experience. But the second part of that which is extremely important is that the pathology of dementia plays havoc with our circadian rhythms and the more you can establish the circadian rhythm the less of the kind of nighttime wandering and the really disturbing aspects of dementia you get the more you can deal with that. And this amazing drawing made by a man who has dementia of himself is showing that predicament, the sense of disorientation. But actually light is the great agent of orientation. And by setting up a good regime of daylight in dementia care centres, what you're actually doing is you're allowing people to sleep much better through the night because you're establishing that deep rhythm. And it's something that happens to all of us that we don't recognise because we can override it. But people with dementia can't and it becomes a critical aspect of their care. So our building is designed within a wall garden with lots of different gardens, all of which different, have different orientations, with different plants and scents in those gardens related to the orientation. And that the people who are using this building can wander around the building through the day, following the sun clockwise around the building with rooms which look into courtyard spaces that are always lit by the sun at different times of the day. And the natural wandering which people do, with dementia do can be structured so they always wander back into the centre again, but on their way they pass through gardens that are illuminated at different times of the day. We made this image of the building to represent this idea of the building like a clock in the middle of a clock face that follows the turning of the day and creates these spaces for people to move around in. These early photographs were taken. We can't show people in these photographs for human rights reasons, but these walls are now covered in planting and the, the, the rooms with very high clear story light. It's extremely important that you have high daylight in the space, but you have no shadows, strong shadows cast onto the floor because people with dementia will not, not understand what the shadows are. So the way in which we deal with daylight through this space and the sense of making spaces at the edge of the building, this is a dream of what it would be like, a window seat by a garden in the shade with daylight that allows you to feel that you're part of the world. And a reflection which we did on this building 10 years after it was built was a drawing we did for the Venice Biennale in 2016 with Yoya Manalapulu. And here we try and draw the person experiencing the world with dementia. And we draw, the, we, we, we imagine that the pen is like the perceiving mind. And so we make the plan of the building out of um, about, about uh, 60 fragments, which goes through 24 hours a day, where people are taken through their daily cycle from waking 
to sleeping and waking again and following them through all of the activities and trying to imagine how they're assembling a sense of the world from the fragments of experience which come with the breakdown of the ability to plan and remember that's central to dementia. So we made these drawing tables so you could film people drawing through the bottom of the table. And here's Michiko Sumi drawing her grandfather who had dementia. She has the family photographs out and she's drawing him waking up in a room. And what's the first thing I perceive? What's the next thing I perceive? And you draw it as you perceive it. And you bring the building into place through perception. Here we are together dining in the dining room mid-morning. We're having much more fun. The four of us are sitting around a dining table dining together. This is the sense of the kind of drawing that we can make for that. And we assemble this into a huge plan of a building that takes you through 24 hours a day. It's not the drawings as objects we have, it's the films we make of the drawings being drawn. And you can see here the space in the Biennale where this thing runs as a 24-hour cycle that also goes through the seasons of the year. And imagines the building from dawn when the first perceptions occur, all the way through. The drawing hands here are perceiving people, the changing of the season, through into nighttime, dream time, and then back again to dawn. I just want to show you some of these details of the character, uh, of, the, of the, the, the close-up character of some of these projections and what's a huge installation. Um, and this is a sense here of drawing the building as it's perceived by people using it, rather than as a kind of allocentric architectural plan. A different issue of daylight I want to speak about is the idea of illumination. The simple thing that we use the word illumination both as a brightness, as a shining of light onto something, but also as an opening up of knowledge or ideas in the mind. And that seemed to me to be a perfect word for a library. And so this is a library which we designed for Magdalen College in Cambridge. And it, it, again, it uses this idea of moving towards and orientating ourselves towards light. So just in front of the marquee there, you can see the Pepys Library, a famous protected building from the, from the 17th century. Um, and beside it, we have a space in the trees, which is going to be the space for our library, which is a substantial new building in the historic heart of a college and overlooking the River Cam. And what we've done is to make a building which is located beside the Pepys Library, which sits in the trees and looks out over the lawn towards the river. Uh, you can see the Pepys Library here has this simple, bricky, Jacobean English character. And the college wanted us to build a building that's shared in that kind of almost simple Jacobean quality. And we made this diagram here. It was based partly on um, Kenneth Frampton's description of the Larkin building by Frank Lloyd Wright which was then, in a sense, imitated or developed by Louis Kahn for the Phillips Research Factory, or the Phillips Research Laboratories. And he makes a very simple observation. Imagine the chimneys here in this image as being the structural supports. And so the first thing they're doing is that gravity, the weight of the building is flowing through gravity down into the ground. So this direction down towards the ground that the weight is given is counteracted by a buoyancy, which is all of the warm air lifting up and being vented out through the chimneys. So you have almost this pulley system that gravity is going down and warm air is going up. And you introduce into that between the cham chimneys these four-sided roof lanterns, so the light is also coming down. And so you have this very simple lattice work in which you create a kind of a circulation pattern with light penetrating into the depth of the section, gravity being drawn down into the ground, and then this countervalent rising of the warm air of the building uh, up and out. And it's that sense that the books can then be placed within that lattice work. And anybody coming into the building can lift up a book and move towards the edge of the building or the top of the building to read the book in the light. And we have a very simple section here, but one that gives me a great deal of pleasure. On the quieter side of the building, on the left-hand side, we have the master's garden. And on the right-hand side, we have the open lawn that looks towards the river. So when you arrive in, uh, the first bay of that building is a triple height space which is crowned by one of the roof lanterns and you rise up beside that into the middle of the section which is a double height space which is crowned by one of the two of the roof lanterns and you rise up through that to the, uh, the right hand side of the section which is a single height space which is the whole length of the building which is crowned by three or four roof lanterns. So you get this orientation to, from a vertical space where you're spiralling up towards the light uh, through to a, mi a middle space where you're, you're, where you're balanced in the light, through to the top space where you're looking out into the light. And it's this orientation and twisting, going back to night fishing at Antibes, the idea that we, like fish, are being drawn up to the light, the place that, uh, that is going to give us uh, the best opportunity with the books. And so the simple pattern of a plan is laid out here with archives and galleries. The triple height spaces to the left, 
And then when you rise up, you see you've left part of the triple height space behind and you're in the long double height space in the center of the plan with these long reading tables. And then when you rise up again, you're on the top floor with this long gallery that runs the length of the building. And you're able to stand in that long gallery and either look out over the river or look back through the triple height space and double height space right back down to the place where you came. And eventually the underlying formal order of the building is expressed most clearly in the roof plan. It's almost crystalline with that balance of chimneys and roof lanterns coming together. And the object which I have on the table in front of me is now being shown as a slide, which is a very simple structure that brings all of those things together. And once you set that lattice work up, it's a question of putting the desks and the light and, man, 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 and maintaining the books so you can take a book easily from a shelf and move off uh, to a position where you can read it with different views depending on how you like to read. So here's the building scene just recently finished from the Fellows Garden and the more broken down profile of it from the Masters Garden. That's the triple height space between the two chimneys that you're looking at there, the other side of the building. But on the river side of the building you can see these oak windows which are projected out of the center of the building and each one of those contains a window seat or a desk. So these are places that you can sit and be in the garden having carried your book from the interior. Just to take you through those spaces then, this is the triple height space, this is taken when the building was in construction, this is the triple height space, looking up into it and feeling that the light is well above you. And as you rise up through that space, there's Esalt reading at a little desk which looks down over that, so you can sort of, you can sit at that position and feel like you're at the centre of things. Then up to the double height space, which is the central room, the main hall, with these long reading tables. If you like to read across a table and feel that you're in companionship and community, you can do that. But above you, you can already see other desks that are overlooking that space. And from that central space, you can move to the edge, and there are very simple single windows that you can look out and sit and be alone. Then rising up through that building to the top, you're now overlooking the double height space and through into the triple height space and you're surrounded by these very simple rooms which are closed off. This is the law library, for example, at the top of the building, which each have their own roof lantern. And then this is the long, one, one aspect of that long single height space at the top of the building overlooking the river. And this nighttime photograph, which I think is a bit like a photographic negative, it shows you that sense of the long space at the top of the building, crowned by the roof lanterns. And it's a bit like a game of snakes and ladders after that. You have these little openings in the floor at the corners of the building that bring light down deep into um, little, little out of the way spaces. And that gives you the opportunity as you come through the building to look up and to see these roof lanterns again and again and to see them framing uh, and bringing the light down into these spaces. Um, the next uh, second last one I want to speak about is the idea of light as corrosion, of light as something which damages. And uh, this amazing painting by Turner showing the sea at Margate, I love it because land, objects, sky and sea have all been turned into one kind of element and light is just bouncing around inside that element. I think it's an extraordinary image of illumination env and, 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 and environment. And this is uh, painted just off in the sea just off Margate. Uh, just a few miles down the coast is Deal where there's a pier which goes out into the sea. And off the coast you have the Goodwin Sands, which has wrecked many fleets over the last thousand years. Uh, the, the Goodwin Sands are extraordinary, they appear and disappear, but this kind of mercurial element that's out there off the coast. But it's a place where ships from London used to wait for a wind, so Deal Pier was very busy. And this is Goodwin Sands, sometimes you can play cricket on them and wait till the tide comes in, and sometimes they're not there at all. A few years ago, a Dornier bomber from the Second World War just appeared on the surface of the sea where the sand had thrown it back up again. And yet you have these, um, you have these extraordinary stories from the last even 50 years of light ships being thrown over and shipwrecks. So it's an extraordinary changeable element. These are the people in Deal, in the, the, the citizens of Deal who are both smugglers and lifeboatmen, depending on what mood they're in. Um, both are playing both sides of the law. And that's the kind of history it has. More recently, it's become a great site for fishing since Edwardian times. And the last couple of piers were blown away by the weather. The most recent one made of reinforced concrete seems to be lasting. And this is a photograph of the pier projecting way out into the English Channel from the beach. And we thought, how would you make a building at the end of this pier? And I remember this drawing in, from Moby Dick of a whale skeleton being turned into a building and the bones of the whale skeleton making the architecture. And I thought, wouldn't it be lovely to make a bare bones building like that, where it felt as if the building had evolved to be in just that environment. And the sense of um, 
the ship-like quality of that. This is a drawing of a trireme where the hull of the ship has got these beautiful outriggers. So we've made a hull instead of a hull, but we've made the outriggers. And the outriggers are there to break the wind and to stop it from dumping down around the edge of the building so you can sit there in blustery weather. And beneath that we have solar shading, which means that you can always look at the horizon in a glassy building without the building overheating. And the solar shading is orientated differently on different sides of the building, a bit like the, 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 the scales of a fish, very subtly changing the way in which the building is read. And then once you've done that, all you have to do is soak up the sound through the acoustic ceiling, throw off the waves through the V-shaped roof, and bring ventilation up through the floor under the building. And it's a very, very simple hall. On the left, public toilets. In the middle, kitchens. On the right, the big hall. On the very right-hand side, a little closed veranda. And drawing and drawing and drawing again to try and make the frame of the building answer the environment and to see how many how simple a frame could answer all the questions that the environment is, 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 is asking. And here we see it then in its final form, the concrete pier we know. The waves break right through that pier in bad weather. No one could go down to the end of it. So the building is left like a ship out in the sea, completely abandoned until people can go back out to it. Um, and then the way in which the frame of the building projects out to create this lattice work which moderates the environment. Very simple elevation. And here you see it built in its most simple form. Now the thing I think is really fascinating about this photograph is look at the first structural bay there and look at the colour of the timber. Even while the building was being built, the timber, the colour of the timber was changing. And you can see the structure was the first thing to be put up and it's already gone grey. And that's that sense of damage and weathering that you get from the sun, which is the other side of daylight. And we promised the client that the combination of salt and sunlight would mean that after 10 years that the timber would look just like the concrete. You can see it here when it's new with its rich kind of ruddy colour. Uh, and these are photographs that were taken not long after it was finished with the building as a kind of shelter for the wintertime fishermen who, who stay beneath the pier all year round. And that sense of it being a sheltering structure. But the warm gold of the interior is the thing that holds and the outside timber begins to change. So after a few years, these boys fishing, they've got their suntan lotion on, but the building is already beginning to turn colour with the undersurfaces a beige colour and the top surfaces a silvery grey. And I went back there recently with my kids and family, uh, that sense of being in the interior, looking towards the horizon, being able to see the horizon on both sides of the building, the sense of being able to be in there and feel like you're al fresco at the end of, of the pier, but watching the way in which the pier was turning. So here it is not long after it was built. In this image, you could even see the scaffolding ties on the timber structure where they roped the scaffolding onto it. That's how much it changed in a short period of time. And now here it is as a completely grey structure melded into the concrete and becoming much more part of that silvery grey maritime environment. And it's that thing of, a, in a sense, predicting and allowing the sun and the salt to do what we know it's going to do that eventually creates the architecture. Um, I want to talk just briefly about a building which is put in the shade it's got a, in, in a Cambridge college in a courtyard um, for, uh, for, for, for singing practice and for musical practice. They want to keep their sheet music in it and this incredibly delicate harpsichord that goes out of tune at any change in relative humidity or temperature. And so the simple thing to do is to plot the site and to put the building in the shade. So the building holds the harpsichord and it sits in the shade and then it leaves the sunny space over in the courtyard for people to sit in. So we tried all these models to make it work. And here you see it as a very simple structure, sitting between these two great chapels, shaded by the chapel, and therefore keeping its temperature of the harpsichord to keep its tuning. And even with that, we have to protect the light that's coming in the windows of those chapels, so that that's, that's protected and our building doesn't affect it. And the idea of the building being like a little tempietto in the centre of the space, a sort of crystalline structure that holds these musical instruments. And we were fascinated by this uh, building in Ethiopia, uh, a temple which is actually cut out of the ground, or a church which is cut out of the ground, the simple figure in the contained space. So here's our one made of Portland stone in the shade of Clare College Chapel. And because it's frequently in the shade and the stone is very cool, we wanted to warm up the interior with the brass boxes and the musical instruments. So this cool Portland stone where there's no natural light to warm it up, the brass is used as a way of kind of creating an artificial gold in that cool environment. And you can see the sense of the warmth that comes from the gold and the musical instruments. And here's that fettlesome, delicate harpsichord which has been kept in the shade um, and allowed to thrive in that environment. The stone architecture that reaches up towards the light. 
and that sense of the balance between the cool, shady interior and the, uh, the, the, the artificial warmth we've brought from the metalwork. The last project I'm going to talk about is a chapel. It's in, uh, near Oxford, and it's for a, uh, an order of nuns uh, and also as a teaching chapel. And the first thing we saw on the site was a beautiful shade beneath the trees. And we thought, what better religious light to have than the shade that comes through trees? And so the building is completely surrounded by trees. The tree at the top of this drawing is the biggest beech tree in England. Um, and so we were able to place the building in that pocket of trees and say that we would bring light into the interior that was the changing light um, of, 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 of woodland. There is the great beech tree with the sacred space made beneath it. There is the pocket of trees that we place it into and the frame of the building as though it's a clearing in the trees itself. And the sense also that the building might be ship-like, that you might feel that you're sitting either beneath a ship or within a ship when you sit within it, the connection between the nave of a church and a ship. And the sense that the building would be made for antiphonal prayer, but the priest showed his hands together here, curved them around to say there would be some sense of growing together for community. So turning that into a drawing and then making an ellipse and then this is the light receiving device, this series of fins that, that hold themselves up in the air and gather the light. And here's the sense that the light in the interior of the chapel is made from the changing light coming through the leaves. And I love that in summertime it's full of the flickering light of leaves and the shadier, and in wintertime it's the, it's the mazy light of branches. And we said we wanted this sense that when you go into the church that the ground is holding you down and the light is making you buoyant as though it's lifting you up. And the most beautiful theological description of daylight by Rudolf Schwartz, the great architectural and theological thinker of the 20th century, where he describes God as being like the star. And he said, you have the star and you have the eye. And in the eye, the darkness of the body rises up. And the light of the star comes into the eye and meets the darkness of the body. And in that place, an image is made. And that's his description, which he then shows here as an architectural plan with the congregation arranged around the altar as though they're an eye. And they are the darkness of the body rising up to the point of the altar where the light of God is met as an incoming light. And we thought this was a really beautiful idea to take into the architecture of the project. We made this model, and we make lots of models in this office. This was great fun because we made it as a hat. And uh, Mariah is wearing a pair of headphones which have got a computer model of the acoustics of the chapel built into it. So you can play voices and music into that and you'll hear what they would sound like in that chapel. And she's wearing a cardboard model of a chapel on her head. And we can take that model out and give it to our clients and we can take them out and they can stand under the trees and actually help them to understand the stories that we're telling about daylight while we're making the building to allow them to invest in that and to believe in that. And the key thing about this building and the section, here it is under the trees, is that we create this very simple separation between the inner skin of the building and the structure. And it's in between that separation between the containing structure and the inner skin that we allow the light to really play. And you can see it here in the section, the way that the roof departs from the structure and holds itself up. So the structure is holding it by its fingertips and the roof is held like a saucer being held by your fingertips. And then the light can sneak in between the structure and the undersurface of the ceiling and we can have great play with that. At the same time, the ambulatory is a space where light plays on the walls around the perimeter and you look into this still centre through the structure. So we made this drawing for the competition. You can see the light of the leaves through the clear story, the freestanding structure and the play of light on the plain walls around the perimeter. And we, off the central ellipse we stuck lots of little special containers for light and each one has a different kind of light. I'll just show them to you briefly. Oh, I'll come back to those in a moment. This is just a little drawing we did of the chapel on the lime floor. The idea of spending a week working together as a team, drawing on the lime like medieval masons and creating a drawing of the chapel. And the sense of, the lovely sense of being able to walk on your own drawing. And here is a time-lapse photograph taken by Ioana of all of us making that drawing on the floor of a Georgian room. And then this is the chapel itself under the great beech tree, the biggest beech tree in England. And the sense here, I think, of being <coughs> a vessel or a chalice that's offered up like a carousel to capture that light and the change of light as it goes around. Murray mentioned the Semperian brickwork or stonework earlier on. <coughs> that gives you a good sense of the changing of light over the stonework and the way in which the light plays on that woven tapestry of stonework. And then all these individual spaces that are like little parcels of light off the main central space. 
The first one at the bottom is the Sisters' Prayer Room. Uh, this one is a little projecting window that looks out over the landscape. Here is the Sisters' Prayer Room with the light sneaking down the walls, and that's the view through across into the chapel. The place where the chalice is, you can see on the far side of that photograph, and you can see the light is blue coming off the sky vault. And then we place the tabernacle into that and make it <coughs> from warm brass. So you read the warm br brass in the blue of the sky vault. And then the sideways window, look at the green coming right in that window against the polished plaster. <coughs> so it really brings the colours of the landscape in there. And this is a lovely memory. Uh, the, the nuns and sisters wanted stained glass, but I said no, and I was very firm about it. So they said they would pray about that. And um, uh, when I built the building, there were ventilation panels at the top of the building that are made from glass louvers. And I didn't know that when the sun shone through the glass louvers, it would send cascades of rainbows through the space. You can't photograph the, the, the rainbows in colour, but those bars of light are all cut bars of multicoloured light that just appear and disappear, and the nuns are delighted with themselves. And we see here the structure held with the light beyond it, and then you begin to see the way the light plays in that space between the structure and the container. And by separating the structure and the container, you get light passing from the outside through on top of the structure and into the depth of the space. And that sense of the building as being like a ship is, I think, clear there, with the ellipse being held up by the structure like a saucer and the light coming through into the gaps. And that gives you the sense of the play between... So the inner world of the chapel is like being held in a hand. That's the kind of comforting interior world within the structure. And then the endlessness of God is expressed by the light playing on the white walls beyond that. And it's that sense of the light coming through that was most important to us that sort of lifts you up towards the light. And the last slide I'll show you then is on the, the day after Candlemas when the chapel was opened and Mariah, the project architect, got up at five o'clock in the morning. She took this photograph and it's the sun rising. And you can see on the left hand side of the image, the horizontal sunlight coming into the building. And on the right hand side of the image, the light the nighttime being chased away by the daylight, the blue of the nighttime as it, as it flees from the room with the daylight coming into it. And if a chapel is anything, it's a world orientating device. It does what architecture does, which is to take a human community, to bring them together and to open them out to the cosmos, to frame their relationship with the cosmos. And that's, I think, what architecture does and how daylight helps it to do it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. Um, what a fascinating talk. I think you can see there from the, um, from the depth of the interpretations and also the, the sheer width of all the kind of references that Neil was just uh, talked about. You can see the, kind of the, the real extent of the thinking, the quality of the thinking that goes into the, the projects that he produces, really, in many ways, an absolute model for architects and architecture students to to emulate if they can. So uh, thank you for that, Neil. It was a very good talk. Um, so what we're going to do now is spend some time um, having a, a discussion really about some of the more general questions raised by the talk. And um, what's happened is we've had some questions sent in already from uh, people in advance who've um, wanted to uh, to ask specific questions about your thinking about daylight. And also I think we will have probably during the course of this talk, there's probably people who have posted uh, questions as well um, as it went along. So we'll try to cover as many as we possibly can, but it, we'll probably start, if that's all right, Neil, with the, the ones that we have already before moving on to the others. And um, I would probably say that these questions, generally, you talked about very specific projects. Obviously, you've designed a lot of projects in your time. You talked about some representative ones. But um, I think these projects here are probably more general about your working process and your thinking as well. So I think that, that maybe give you a chance to expand as well on, 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 in other ways as well. So if it's all right with you, I'll, I'll kick off with the, the first one. Um, and this is quite a personal one here. It says, looking back at your time as a student and as a young architect, is there any essential knowledge about daylighting, uh, obviously the subject of the talk today, any specific, any essential knowledge that you wish you had had when you were starting off? If you can remember back then. I think that question slightly undermines the notion of a career as a process of discovery. Um, if you had all of the knowledge at the beginning of your career, I'm sure you'd have an exemplary career, but it would be less of a journey. <laughs> And I think that I'm, <coughs> for architecture students and for practicing architects, and particularly for young practicing architects, I'm interested in how we deal with experimentation and, you know, building to find out, mm -hmm. you know, building to discover. 
Um, and so every time you make a building, it, you come back with the building that you wish you'd made. Yeah. And I've got a whole suite of the buildings that I wish I had made if I had that chance to do it again. And I often even hound my clients sometimes and <laughs> suggest I could come back and improve their building in some way with the benefit of hindsight. But the curious thing about the building is you sort of give it to the world and the knowledge that you acquire over time is something that's part of the journey of your life. Mm. I think that from the very beginning, I was really fascinated with um, conditions of light. And um, I, what I would say um, is that now we have these extraordinarily powerful computational tools that allow us to think about light. And I think there's a danger that they let you know about light in your head, but not in your water. Um, and that if you want to understand light really intuitively and deeply, you need to make physical models. And you need to hold those models up under the sky and to play with them and to use them as tools to design with light. And uh, not simply to make a model of the building and then stick it in the light and say that's good enough, but actually from the very beginning to allow what the light is telling you from the model making to actually change and modulate what you're doing. And I think that would be, I mean, it's really interesting with the model we have in front of us here, that this building changed so much, the, 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 the library. If you look at the original designs for the library, they were absolutely nothing like this. Mm -hmm. And it was a conversation about light and the way that light is brought into the space that completely drove the design of this building. And it was done through making very simple models like this and then expanding on those models and making larger ones so you can actually see the light entering the building. And I think it's that sense of, um, of, 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 trying to, of trying to understand it and to feel it physically that I would say would be the main lesson that I've had from my career. Mm. That's very interesting because it touches also on the, uh, some things we have obviously discovered and the things that are interesting. Uh, uh, interests of mine really this idea that architecture rather than being a fixed body of knowledge something you can get taught and just learn is actually a process of research so a process of ongoing research which I guess develops over time etc the other thing it does strike me is that um, not to caricature it too much but you find that quite a lot of architects put a lot of uh, innovation and research into earlier projects and then after a certain point in the career this the, the office gets bigger and becomes more standardized etc and I suppose it's quite telling of your office that you're really sort of treating your projects, I think, very much in the same way you, you always have done. You haven't developed kind of like a, a house style. You haven't really kind of done for, gone for shortcuts. You tend to sort of think about your projects really quite, quite afresh, I think. Yeah, I think there's a very strong tendency to standardise. I mean, in part, there are some benefits that come from that because you're, you're winning knowledge and you're winning expertise and you're then using that in new buildings. But there is a danger with that, that you begin to fall into a pattern and that you stop innovating and experimenting. I think we've made a decision in our office never to let it grow beyond a certain size so that we can keep uh, an experimental community together and that people feel invested in that experimentation and that the drive of the early projects is held through discussions which we have in the office. And we definitely see it as a benchmark of projects that we're doing where we say, well, what are we discovering in this project? And recently, we turned down a project because we weren't sure that it was going to offer us the discoveries that we wanted in terms of the scope of the commission. Mm -hmm. And I think for us, we're, a, we're a, 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 you know, a teaching, learning, research office that is in practice to produce good buildings, but also to develop new ideas and new ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that came out uh, incredibly well in the talk. So we move on to the next question. And I think this is one that you will like. I think it's something that is close to your heart. This is about um, how do you investigate the site at the start of a project? And from those kind of initial investigations, how do you start to consider daylight and things like orientation in the process? You know, what, I think people are sort of interested in your, your sort of uh, approach, given the site to put a building on, how would you go about assessing it? Well, I'm a funny person. I don't know if it's true of everybody else, but when I go to a restaurant with my wife, I'm incredibly annoying because I want to sit at five tables before I found the one that's facing the right direction with my back to that and my view of that. And I'm, incredibly, I'm incredibly aware of... I, I can never find a good word for it. And there are theoretical problems with the word I like, which I call it situatedness. I, don't, I mean, it's, it's the ability to, to feel that you are situated in a place. And for me, that's a, a combination of all kinds of things to do with orientation, aspect, ground form, temperature, shade, protection, privacy. It's a very complex set of phenomena. 
And I love to go to a site and to spend time in the site and to try and follow the site through time and to witness it on different occasions and to find ways of doing really rain splattered drawings of the site that are just notations of the things that you took down that allowed you to, that allowed you to feel the site. I think there's all sorts of research you can come away and do about it afterwards. I'm extremely interested, in a sense, in stories that we can tell about, this, about places. The sense that place is constituted by conferring meaning on a location is quite important for me. And so I'm always interested in the stories that people tell about them. But I'm also interested in that idea of situatedness. I once took my students to the Aran Islands, which are a very exposed outcrop on the west coast of Ireland, and set them a preliminary project to spend an hour on the site in jeans and a t-shirt. And all of them had found out exactly <laughs> where <laughs> to sit their building after, after an hour on an exposed Atlantic location in fairly sparse clothing. It's that sense of being like the, the way a cat finds the warm bonnet of a car as a place to lie on. There's, there, there's that sense of, 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 of physically being in the site and understanding uh, placement in those terms. Yeah. So that's, that's very good answer. And this also comes out of the question, this idea of um, responding to a site, actually taking something from a site, one that tends to say thing that people go to a site and think about what they can do on that site, but it strikes me very much you're trying to look at what the site's telling you. I was taken by the, your first observation for the chapel at Cudston being about the light under a tree there, you know, as opposed to anything you were doing. It was something you were sort of taking from that site, really, as well, and responding to that. So I think it's a really interesting answer. Um, the next one, um, which is again is, is on a slightly different subject, but an interesting one. And can you talk about the relationship between the planning of natural and artificial light in your projects? And you obviously gave us some examples, you know, about this way in which you kind of combine the two. And obviously, architects like Alvar Aalto, but a number of architects have been really quite a, very thoughtful and subtle about this. But maybe just talk about how you sort of sort of try to gauge the relationship between the two. Do you see them as supplementing each other? Um, or so I suppose I post that. Do you find them fighting against each other? And what sort of qualities do you go for in, in, in that sort of combination? Given the fact that probably most buildings will be somehow involving both. I mean, it goes without saying that we currently design buildings so that they shouldn't depend upon artificial light in their in their daily use. Um, having said that, I mean, you'll see in a lot of the projects that I've shown that I'm very interested in painting artificial light into natural light mm. in interiors. And I, 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 I'm, I'm very interested in the play of colour temperatures that you can get. I understand ethically all the reasons why you can't use those old tungsten bulbs anymore, but I do miss that gold, that irreplaceable <laughs> gold that comes from tungsten. I find a, I find a lot of modern artificial lighting, I, I'm, I'm extremely sensitive to kind of problematic aspects of colour temperature. Uh, in, in modern artificial lighting. Um, I, I, I hope there'll be you know, developments that allow us to be as precise with that as, as we can be. But what I'm very interested in, you'll see even in this office here, we have a few lights on even during the day because I enjoy watching the way in which the register of the changing light of the day is playing against that, that lamp which is above my desk, for example. Um, I, really in, I, I, I really enjoy that and you can see we're playing the two off each other. I think if you paint in artificial light in that way, I think it's absolutely fine. And I think it's worth thinking when you're designing a building. We tend to think about it in terms of static conditions of light. It'll have a nighttime condition, which is that, and it'll have a daytime condition, which is that. But very often we're in those, mm. those beautiful hours that most of us like the most, mm. when day is turning into light and the lights are coming on and it's not quite got dark yet, and you feel the world turning. Mm. I feel those are things that you can design. Mm. And mm. one of the things I love most in London, particularly in wintertime, is just walking around and seeing lights coming on inside houses. Mm. You get it more in the Netherlands, I notice, that people don't put curtains in their windows, and you just look in, and it's like an advent calendar. You have these kind of inner worlds that you just look into. And I find that sense of the warmth of the warmth of interior light, of artificial light, mm. playing against the changing colour temperature of natural light. Mm. There's kind of endless enjoyment in that. Yeah, well, that's quite interesting. This idea of colour temperature somehow unifying two um, types of light, which I guess quite often are seen as ant antithetical. Really, this idea that it draws them both together, and there's a creative synergy in both of them. I think that's a, a very good response. Uh, this uh, question here is now more about materials and light, you know, and we, we mentioned at the beginning you're interested in Gottfried Semper and theories about tectonics, etc. And you referred to obviously a few uh, examples of that in there, Louis Kahn and what have you, etc. 
And how would you then describe the relationship between materials and light in your project? I mean, in a more general sense, have you thought about, you know, the, I guess, what, what do they give each other? Is there a relative waiting? Does one come first? Do they both come together? It would be quite interesting just to know how you, you might schematise, shall we say, the relationship between materials and light. Okay, so there's slightly two components to that question. You, I mean, you, you brought Semper into the start of it, and you've mentioned Semper a My few fault. times. <laughs> so I should maybe just, just refer to that for a moment, which is that um, I came to Semper through Mies van der Rohe, who was my sort of guiding light when I was a student and a young practitioner. And in a sense, Mies produces a kind of perfect en passe in his work, that you either are going to do that or you're failing in a way. And I wanted to try and open back out of that and discover more about the hinterland of Mies in terms of the ideas that come out of um, German idealism in the 19th century and the way in which those feed into architecture and architectural thinking, which produces somebody like Mies. And uh, so I'm kind of fascinated by the figures who are around me. Schwartz is one of them, of course, but mm. Semper. These figures who, 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 who are implicit terms in his thinking, but we don't necessarily recognize anymore. And one of the dilemmas that Semper deals with is the dilemma of representation. And he, he, you know, he, he talks about things as having a core form and a kunst form, a, a, a core form and a representational form. And it, I, in many ways, it allows you to deal with these issues in materials about truth to materials. Mm. Semper isn't in the way that we are interested in truth to materials. So, you know, he's, it's almost the opposite. He says the destruction of the material is when the idea begins. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's like an inversion of those modernist yeah. notions. And I found it extremely fruitful, particularly when in modern constructional culture, you can't actually represent you, the, the truth telling vocation of modernism is not possible in the context of modern construction. And so Semper gives you a way of thinking about that. Mm -hmm. And that's why I developed an interest in him. Um, at the same time, the, the next part of that question is about the interaction of light and materials. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the thing I would say is that, I mean, generally speaking, the light of the sun is just a, some blinding pure white that goes through space that has almost no identity for us at all. And it only becomes apparent in any way when it meets materials. Mm. So if it when it meets the atmosphere, it changes color in a thousand ways. And if you think about that as being the first stage in the identity of light, that it acquires identity by encountering the Earth's atmosphere, then the next levels of identity it acquires are when it meets your building, uh, in terms of the experience of somebody within the building, or meets parts of the landscape outside it. And so it's always the so surface that light is bouncing off, or the the way in which you see one kind of light through another kind of light that interests me. For example, in the chapel for the Carmelites, I talked about seeing the, the, the profuse green of a garden through the gold of this room, and that that sets up a kind of a fizz between them, mm. that these two, the, the, these two colors really play off each other, and they make the two terms more real to each other. They, 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 they set up a comparative identification. And so I'm always interested in the relative character of materials and light in relation to each other. In the sacristy, the thing I took from an Italian villa I saw where you bounce the, the south light off the gold reveal of the window. So it's almost more warm when it comes in. Um, so it's those things that I want to do that in a sense create, because light, I, well, the point I'm trying to make is that light doesn't have an identity in itself. It develops identity through the materials that it touches. And those materials are, first of all, the atmosphere, secondly, the landscape, mm -hmm. and thirdly, the materials that you make. And so the materials that you make are immediately involved in a dialogue with these things that, that light has already encountered. And again and again, what we're trying to do is to give the light a particular character by playing it off the things that we put in the space. And for me, that's what the material quality is. And I hope you can see in the, you know, to create the dog tooth bond on the weave of the outside of the chapel and to place it on an ellipse, you know you're going to create a phenomenon because mm. the light will be moving around that differentially all the time. Mm. And so you get that sense that you're almost seeing dawn and dusk and midday on the surface of the building. So what you're doing is you're bringing, you're bringing light, to, to light to someone's attention by creating the dog tooth and the bond of the brick. Um, at the same time, I'm quite interested in, in, in the meaning and the cultural understanding of light. So the vestments laid on the counter of the monastery are telling you something about the church calendar as the light hits them. You walk in, the priest knows immediately the church day it is as soon as they see the vestments on the counter. Mm -hmm. So it's always, it's always that sense of the, the sort of second-hand na nature of light, that it's borrowed its character from the things it's touched. Yeah. Yeah. No, again, that's a very fascinating answer. I mean, the, the question, you, it makes it sound like it's just pure building materials that we were talking about. We're also talking about clothing and vestments and, I guess, 
people as well. There are other materials in architecture as opposed to the ones we might see classically as building materials. And that's all um, uh, very fascinating. I mean, one of the things that came to me from listening to your talk, because I've also heard several of your talks and hearing this particular one, just you have a fascination with clocks and orreries. There seemed to be something about you know, a fascination with this time, this time in light and the rhythms, I suppose, the circadian rhythms or something like that. There seems to be quite a strong uh, feature. Um, you know, that, that light is not something that has a f one fixed quality. It's something which is inherently um, transitory, I guess, and changing. Yes. Um, I think that partly I have, a, I have a, uh, an interest that I can't rationally justify at the moment with any kind of apparatus. Um, and I love apparatuses. I, I, I love, I mean, in the sense I love to see an apparatus that's transparent. In other words, that the apparatus shows you what it does. And it might be being a creature of you know, an age that produces these kind of things, that everything is, everything is totally invisible. That I think that the fascination with our age, and perhaps in the school that we teach in with the apparatus, has got to do with, it's a, maybe it's a slightly nostalgic thing, but it's a yearning to be grounded in a transparency where you understand how things work. I think that's one aspect of it. I think there's a second aspect for me, which is that the more, I'm looking a lot, as you mentioned earlier on, at the Neolithic, and particularly the junction between the Paleolithic and the Neolithic, when humans moved from, um, from, from a transitory relationship with the environment, where they moved through it all the time, where settled life came about. Um, and you would think that settled life comes about, and then we have ideas of time and all of these things. But actually, it's, it, I think it's a sense of a change of our idea of what time is that begins to produce mm -hmm. architecture, mm -hmm. which begins mm -hmm. to produce settlement. Mm -hmm. And there are some really deep things about human culture and human nature. Mm -hmm. And the way it happens is that you get what are called delayed return investments, mm -hmm. where communities have to invest in something and then not get a return from it from some, for some time afterwards. And in order to hold the community together during that fallow period when you're waiting for the return, mm -hmm. you have to create something that, ho that binds the community together. Mm -hmm. And I think building was one of the activities that began to do that. Mm -hmm. And also the sense that you have an ancestry or that you have a history. And um, a lot of the really interesting uh, uh, anthropologists like Hodder and so on are looking at architecture as being the creation of histories, that the buildings create histories mm -hmm. which allow people to hold themselves together as communities over time. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about the northwestern European Neolithic, like the, the stones in Orkney, where it appears as though the purpose of creating these great stone circles was not some finite object that everybody had to club together to build and then finish and dust their hands on, but it was actually the activity of creating it that created something like a blood bond between people. Because they were making this thing together, they had to hold themselves together to do it, and that was the purpose of architecture. So time, community, construction, structure, all of those things are at the root of architecture, and maybe architecture is more a manifestation of time than anything else. Yeah, that's an absolutely brilliant answer really and I guess it's just a, obviously true that if you look at the history of Stonehenge or something like that, it was a building project that went on for centuries, even thousands of years, so it was a, uh, shall we say, more of a process I guess, almost than an object. Um, so this is another um, uh, question here, this is a more specific one really, I guess, um, it's asking what software do you use for daylight simulation, but maybe we could expand that a little bit, because I think you're quite interested in obviously in using analogue techniques as well, so maybe if you could just talk about, you know, how, uh, more the nitty gritty of how you start to analyse. I feel I have films. to do justice to the questioner to tell you that I have absolutely no idea what software <laughs> I, I thought use. That meant but then I have no idea what software we use generally. I'm afraid, I in that I'm afraid here's my software. <laughs> um, sorry, what's the second question? No, the second, just, you're, you're, just, just about, you know, I think they're interested about, you know, this is, a, a presume, a student or a, a, who's probably asking about, you know, how you go about analysing it. You, you were talking before about some of the analogue techniques you'd used. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, mean I, I think for me, we, we make models and we hold the models in the light and we turn them and we think about them in the light and we think about, we think about the way that materials interact with the light and I, I, I draw light a lot with my pen in, in my notebook but, I, but, but there's a point at which when we do empirical calculations of light that it's not something that, that I do because I, th there, there are answers that you might get from it but they're, but, but they're not... They're not um, and we have engineers and there are people in the office who, who, for example, there's a simple program we all have on Rhino or SketchUp where we follow the sun through the day in the building. 
But I always look about. I always look at that in a slightly dispassionate way, like I'm watching a movie that I'm not really part of. <laughs> and I, it, I mean, that's just me. While now I'm looking out the door there, and I can see the way the light is coming in off that surface, and the way that I'm getting a brighter light on it. And, and suddenly I'm, I'm engaged with it. So for me, I'm very old-fashioned. Light is an actual thing. You know, it's like it's like it, it's a physical thing that I experience and witness. Uh, in the world, but I know that there are people who work for me who analyze it d digitally. I just don't do it myself. Yeah, yeah. No, that reminds me of uh, one of my colleagues was somebody called Mike Wilson, and we were with Peter Dragenza wrote some of the most important books on daylighting, certainly within the UK context, etc. And I remember Mike saying that you know the, all the software. It gives you an approximation as best. People start treat it as if it's an actual real analysis, but it's not. It's the best approximation, and that you cannot beat in the end analog testing. If you, yeah. want to, if you really want to get to the real precision, you know, if you don't want to just do it as a general thing, if you want to get really right, you have to analog test it. But, but I mean, we're designing a school at the moment and we're working with engineers who are doing constant daylight analysis to make sure that the level of daylight in every single classroom is enough to maintain student concentration through the afternoon. So we take that very seriously, but at the end of it, when I get that data back as numbers, I'll just go back to the model and say, right, well, we need to make that rude light a bit bigger there, and I'll, I'll, I'll do it you know, in a much more approximate kind of way, and then they'll recalculate it until we get it right. So it's not that those numbers aren't important, it's just that I can't count them. Yeah, yeah, and they're not necessarily the answer. Okay, and so this is a final question, really, because obviously we've heard many things we could talk about as well. I thought it's always good to end on a sort of an upbeat message, and I think, Neil, this um, question will resonate with you, and I'm sure it was written by somebody who's about to qualify uh, as an architect, and says, what would be your advice to a young architect going out into practice today? Um, I easy. mean, I mean, to me, I think that the acquisition of skills is extremely important. And I think the acquisition of core skills is extremely important. And architectural graduates coming from different schools will feel that they've had a chance within those schools to acquire those skills. The idea of immersing yourself in building culture as quickly as possible, um, to try and join a practice where you get the opportunity to be on construction sites and to see things being built that you drew as soon as possible and to try to go to a practice where there are enough experienced people in that practice that you can actually learn from them um, and to try and to, to, to make, I mean, I have spent my whole life trying to learn how to detail buildings and I feel like I'm way towards the bottom of that hill. And I think that you know, in our office, we, 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 even in an experiment culture, you're asking yourself all the time, is this going to work? Is this going to work? So architecture is primarily an aspect of building culture. And I think particularly coming out of education, try not to go into a practice that's going to capitalize only on your 3D modeling skills or your digital skills or your, you know, your desktop publishing skills or your ability to make colored images. Try to go into a practice that's actually going to teach you how to be a builder and how to, how, how to, 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 to learn how to communicate with builders and to earn respect from builders and to be part of building culture. I think for me that's by far the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Excellent advice and I think um, it, uh, symptomatic of what I thought was an absolute brilliant uh, talk today. Hopefully you've enjoyed that and obviously tune in for further Daylight Lectures. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much, Murray. Thank you.